This is Shorts in Psychology and welcome to our second video in the learning topic. In this video I will discuss the key concepts in operant conditioning including schedules of reinforcement followed by some past exam questions. Operant conditioning, sometimes referred to as instrumental conditioning, is a method of learning that occurs through rewards and punishments for behaviour. Through operant conditioning an individual makes an association between a particular behaviour and a consequence. For example, when a lab rat presses a blue button, he receives a food pellet as a reward, but when he presses the red button, he receives a mild electric shock. As a result, he learns to press the blue button, but avoid the red button. But operant conditioning is not just something that takes place in an experimental setting. It also plays a powerful role in everyday learning. Reinforcement and punishment take place almost every day in natural settings, as well as in more structured settings such as the classroom. Let's take a closer look at how operant conditioning is used to change old behaviours and teach new ones. There are several key concepts in operant conditioning. Reinforcement is any event that strengthens or increases the behaviour it follows. Punishment is defined as the opposite of reinforcement, since it is designed to weaken or eliminate a response rather than increase it. Positive reinforcement strengthens a behaviour by providing a consequence an individual finds rewarding, such as praise or a direct reward. For example, if your teacher gives you $5 each time you complete your homework, i.e. a reward, you will be more likely to repeat this behaviour in the future, thus strengthening the behaviour of completing your homework. The removal of an unpleasant stimulus can also strengthen behaviour. This is known as negative reinforcement because a response is strengthened by the removal of something considered unpleasant. For example, if your child starts to scream in the middle of the grocery store but stops once you hand him a treat, you will be more likely to hand him a treat the next time he starts to scream. Your action led to the removal of the unpleasant condition, the child screaming, negatively reinforcing your behaviour. Ultimately, in both of these cases of reinforcement, the behaviour increases. Before we move on to punishment, let's look at another example of each type of reinforcement. In this scenario, the antecedent is that Johnny has no coke. The behaviour of asking for coke politely is positively reinforced by the addition of a pleasant stimulus, the coke. Thus, Johnny is more likely to use his manners to politely ask for coke in the future. This scenario is negative reinforcement as the behaviour of putting in earplugs is strengthened through the removal of an aversive stimulus, the snoring noise. Punishment is defined as the opposite of reinforcement since it is designed to weaken or eliminate a response rather than increase it. It is an aversive event that decreases the behaviour that it follows. As for reinforcement, there are two kinds of punishment. Positive punishment presents an unfavourable event or outcome in order to weaken the response it follows. Spanking for misbehaviour is an example of positive punishment. Negative punishment occurs when a favourable event or outcome is removed after a behaviour occurs. Taking away a child's video game following misbehaviour is an example of negative punishment. Ultimately, in both of these cases of punishment, the behaviour decreases. However, there are many problems with using punishment, such as the fact that punished behaviour is not forgotten but suppressed, so the behaviour returns when punishment is no longer present. It can also create fear that can generalise to undesirable behaviours, such as fear of school. And punishment doesn't necessarily guide toward desired behaviour. Reinforcement tells you what to do, whereas punishment only tells you what not to do. Let's look at another example of each type of punishment. Bart is disruptive in class, which is a behaviour his teacher wants to weaken. If she was to weaken his disruptive behaviour using positive punishment, she could add an aversive stimulus such as after school detention. To weaken Bart's behaviour using negative punishment, his teacher could remove a desirable stimulus such as his skateboard. Either way, Bart's disruptive behaviour should be weakened in other words, he is less likely to act disruptively in class in future. It can be difficult to identify whether the operant conditioning technique used in a scenario is a form of reinforcement or punishment. In particular, distinguishing between negative reinforcement and punishment can be challenging. These three simple steps should help make this process easier. The first step is to define the behaviour. 
For example, a child is given dessert for eating all of their vegetables. Secondly, identify whether something is being added or subtracted. In this case, a pleasant stimulus, dessert, is being added, making this positive reinforcement or punishment. Lastly, identify whether the behaviour is increasing or decreasing in frequency. In this example, the child is more likely to eat their vegetables in future due to the addition of a pleasant stimulus, dessert, so it is positive reinforcement. Now that we've done some examples together, see how you go answering the following past exam questions. Pause the video for a moment while you read and attempt this question. Let's use the three steps described earlier to help us answer this question. The first step is to define the behaviour. In this scenario, Leah is wearing her blue goggles. Step two, identify whether something is being added or subtracted. In this scenario, something is being added. Leah is winning her races. This means it is a positive type of operant conditioning. Finally, identify whether the behaviour is increasing or decreasing in frequency. Lee's behaviour of wearing her blue goggles is increasing in frequency as she is wearing them every time she competes, hence this is positive reinforcement. Let's look at one more example before we move on to schedules of reinforcement. Pause the video again while you read and attempt the question. Let's use the same three steps again. The antecedent behaviour in this scenario is that Riley is being bitten by mosquitoes. Using the cream is removing the unpleasant stimulus, which is the itching. This subsequently increases the frequency of the behaviour of using the cream, as Riley is using it every time he is bitten by mosquitoes. Hence, this scenario is an example of negative reinforcement. Reinforcement is not necessarily a straightforward process, and there are a number of factors that can influence how quickly and how well new things are learned. When and how often behaviours are reinforced play a role in the speed and strength of acquisition. In other words, the timing and frequency of reinforcement influences how new behaviours are learned and how old behaviours are modified. In particular, the schedule of reinforcement affects the response rate, which is the rate at which the learner displays the desired behaviour, and the extinction rate, the rate at which people will go on repeating the behaviour without reinforcement. There are several schedules of reinforcement that impact the operant conditioning process. Continuous reinforcement involves delivering a reinforcement every time a response occurs. Learning tends to occur relatively quickly, yet the response rate is quite low. Extinction also occurs very quickly once reinforcement is halted. Partial or intermittent reinforcement involves only delivering a reinforcement some of the time. The timing of reinforcement can be based on interval of time or after a number of responses called a ratio schedule. In a fixed interval schedule, reinforcement occurs after a certain interval of time has passed. For example, being paid by the hour or a rat receiving a pellet every 15 minutes in a Skinner box, providing at least one lever press has been made. Using this schedule, response rates remain fairly steady and start to increase as the reinforcement time draws near, but slow immediately after the reinforcement has been delivered. In a variable interval schedule, reinforcement is given after an unpredictable amount of time has passed, providing one correct response has been made, for example on average every five minutes. An example is a self-employed person being paid at unpredictable times, or receiving an email on average once every 10 minutes. This tends to lead to a fast response rate and slow extinction rate. In a fixed ratio schedule, the behaviour is reinforced only after the behaviour has occurred a specific number of times. For example, a child receives a star for every five words spelled correctly. This typically leads to a fairly steady response rate and medium extinction rate. Variable ratio schedules are also a type of partial reinforcement that involve reinforcing behaviour after a varied number of responses, for example gambling or fishing. A pokey machine may pay off on average once every 50 pulls. This leads to both a high response rate and slow extinction rate due to the unpredictability of the reinforcement. 
This table shows you a side-by-side -side comparison of each of the partial schedules of reinforcement in terms of the response rate and resistance to extinction. Again, as already mentioned, the variable ratio schedule is often the most effective as it has a high response rate and constant response pattern, as well as being the most resistant to extinction. To conclude, let's look at a past exam question on schedules of reinforcement. Pause the video while you answer the question. If we look at part A, the reinforcement is being given based on the customer response, rather than an interval of time, so it is a ratio schedule. As customers are being reinforced after a set number of responses, every five cups of coffee, it is a fixed ratio schedule. In part B, the mother is reinforcing the baby every time it cries, so this is an example of a continuous reinforcement schedule. Hopefully this video has helped you understand the key principles of operant conditioning and how to identify them in scenarios. As always, thanks for listening.